4. Life in Exile, the days of November, 1850, fall almost exactly in the middle of Marx's life and they represent, not only externally, an important turning point in his life's work. Marx himself was keenly aware of this and Engels perhaps even more so. Writing to Marx in February, 1851, Engels declares, One can see more and more that exile is an institution in which everyone must necessarily become a fool, an ass and a scurvy knave unless he withdraws from it completely and contents himself with being an independent writer who doesn't bother his head in the least about the so-called revolutionary party. And Marx answered, I very much like the public isolation in which we two now find ourselves, it is quite in accordance with our attitude and our principles, the system of mutual concessions, of half measures tolerated for the sake of appearances, and the necessity of taking one's share of the responsibility in the eyes of the general public together with all those fools, is now at an end. And Engels again. We have now once more an opportunity, for the first time in a very long time, of showing that we need no popularity and no support from any party in any country. That our position is completely independent of such trivialities, from now on we are responsible to ourselves alone. By the way, we can hardly complain about the fact that the petite grands hommes avoid us, for years we acted as though the ragtag and bobtail were our party, although we had no party and the people whom we considered as belonging to our party, at least officially, did not understand even the elementary principles of our cause. It would be wrong to take the expressions fools asses and knaves all too seriously, and a certain amount may be deducted from these spirited remarks. But what then remains shows us that Marx and Engels rightly regarded their decision to cut themselves loose from the fruitless squabbles of the exiles as their salvation, they withdrew, as Engels said, into a certain isolation in order to continue their scientific studies until such time as men should better understand their cause, however, the cut was not made so thoroughly, so quickly and so deeply as would appear to the retrospective observer, in the letters which the two exchanged in the following years we find that the internal struggles amongst the exiles play a very considerable role. And this was due to the ceaseless friction which occurred between the two factions into which the Communist League had split, if to no other reason, and further, although Marx and Engels had decided to take no more part in the noisy squabbles of the emigration, this certainly did not mean the abandonment of all part in the political struggles of the day, they continued to contribute to the Chartist newspapers and they did not accept the disappearance of the Neuer Inicia Review as final, a publisher named Skabelitz in Basel offered to undertake the continuation of the review, but in the end nothing came of it, Marx then opened up negotiations with Hermann Becker, who had succeeded in maintaining his position in Cologne as editor of the Westdeutsche Zeitung for some time and, when that was finally suppressed, had taken over a small publishing house, Marx wanted to have his works published in a collected edition and to issue a quarterly magazine from Liege, however, this plan was spoiled by the arrest of Becker in May, 1851, though one pamphlet of the collected works did actually appear, two volumes were to have been published, each containing 400 pages, and whoever subscribed to the venture before the 15th of May was to receive the volumes in 10 brochures at 8 silver groschen each. And after that the sale price was to be 1 taler and 15 silver groschen for each volume. The first brochure was quickly sold out, but Weidemeyer's statement that 15,000 copies were sold is probably an error. For even one tenth of that figure would have been quite a fair success for those days. When drawing up these plans Marx was under the urgent necessity of making a living. He and his family were living in great poverty. In November, 1849, the fourth child, a son named Guido, was born, and its mother wrote. The poor little angel suckled so many cares and worries that it was always ill and in violent pains day and night. Since it came into the world it has not slept a single night properly, and never more than two or three hours at a time. This child died about a year after its birth. The family was evicted in the most brutal and ruthless fashion from its first home in Chelsea, for although the rent had been paid to the leaseholder, the latter had not paid it to the landlord. After many difficulties they succeeded in finding a temporary shelter in a German hotel in Leicester Street near Leicester Square, and shortly afterwards they moved into 28, Dean Street, Soho Square. For the next six years the two rooms in Dean Street offered the family a permanent shelter, however, this did not settle their financial troubles, which steadily increased. Towards the end of October, 1850, Marx wrote to Weidemeyer in Frankfurt on Main asking him to take the family silver out of pawn and sell it at the best price he could get for it. 
saving only a small case of spoons, etc., belonging to little Jenny. At the moment my situation is that I must get hold of money under all circumstances in order to be able to go on working. At about the same time Engels departed for Manchester to devote himself to, damned business and certainly in order to be able to assist his friend financially. Apart from Engels, friends in need proved to be rare and in 1850 Frau Marx wrote to Weidemeyer. The thing that hits me hardest of all and makes my heart bleed is that my husband is worried by so many petty troubles. He could be assisted with so little, but he who always helped others so readily is left helpless himself. Please don't think, Herr Weidemeyer, that we are asking anyone for anything, but at the very least my husband could justly ask those who turned to him for so many ideas and for support. To show a little more business energy and interest in his review, they owe him that little, and I am not ashamed to say so, after all, no one was defrauded in the matter, it hurts me, but my husband thinks differently, he has never lost his confidence in the future, not even in the worst moments, and he has always kept up his good spirits and was happy if he saw me in a good humor and our dear children making a fuss of me, and as she looked after him when friends were silent, so he looked after her when enemies were all too vociferous in their attacks. In August, 1851, Marx again wrote to Weidemeyer, You can imagine that my situation is gloomy, my wife will go under if it lasts much longer. The continual troubles and the petty day-to-day -day struggle to make ends meet are wearing her out, and on top of all this there is the infamy of my opponents, who do not even attempt to attack me objectively but revenge themselves for their impotence by casting suspicion on me and spreading the most indescribable infamies about me. As far as I am concerned, I should laugh at the whole business and I am not letting it interfere with my work in the least, but you can imagine that it is no relief to my wife, who is ill, whose nervous system is run down and who is forced to struggle with miserable poverty from morning to night, when foolish go-betweens bring her the latest exhalations from the democratic sewers. The tactlessness of some people in this respect is often colossal. A few months previously Frau Marx had given birth to a daughter, Franziska, and despite an easy confinement she had been very ill, more for psychological than for physical reasons. There was not a penny in the house and at the same time we exploited the workers and worked for a dictatorship as Marx wrote in a bitter mood to Engels. Marx's scientific studies were a never-failing source of consolation to him. He sat from nine o'clock in the morning to seven o'clock in the evening in the British Museum, and, referring to the empty bombast of Kinkle and Villish, he once declared, Naturally, the democratic simpletons whose inspiration comes from above have no need to do anything of that sort. Why should the innocents bother their heads about economics and history? As the worthy Villish used to say to me, Everything is so simple. Everything is so simple. In their confused heads perhaps, the simpletons. At that time Marx hoped to have his critique of political economy completed within a few weeks and he began to look for a publisher. A search which once again caused him one disappointment after another. In May, 1851, a loyal friend on whom Marx could rely absolutely, Ferdinand Freiligrott, came to London, and during the next few years the two remained in close touch. But bad news followed quickly on his heels. On the 10th of May the tailor Nuth Jung was arrested in Leipzig whilst on a tour of agitation as a representative of the Communist League. Papers which he carried betrayed the existence of the League to the police, and soon after the members of the Central Committee in Cologne were arrested, Freiligrott himself had escaped by the skin of his teeth and without even knowing the danger he was in. When he arrived in London the various factions amongst the German exiles immediately fought each other tooth and nail for the privilege of the famous poet's allegiance. But he put a stop to this by informing them that he stood with Marx and his circle, and he refused to attend a meeting which took place on the 14th of July, 1850.